Hi all. For our notable game today, let's continue looking at the evolution of chess style, and in particular David Bronstein on the lead up to his world championship encounter with Mikhail Botvinnik. He played fantastically well at the Budapest Candidates Tournament of 1950. And this is another amazing game. He was playing against Miguel Neidorf here. Let's see what happened. So David Bronstein, white. 18th of April 1950 in the Budapest Candidates Tournament played in Hungary. So we see a Nimzo Indian defense and here David Bronstein plays quite a rare bird move a3 immediately kicking that bishop quite often e3 nowadays queen c2 or knight f3 these are the three most popular move choices. Nevertheless a3 has some popularity and is not without venom it's encouraging black to damage the pawn structure obviously but the pieces are very important as well so we have the double pawns and they're immediately blockaded Nimzovich would be proud e3 knight c6 we have bishop d3 note white has the bishop pair in particular this bishop would like to be liberated in this position if possible uh, black castles, knight e2, d6, e4, and quite often here e5 to try and lock the center is played. There's 26 games in the live book, for example, like this, where black is playing h6 to stop this bishop g5 pin as well here. This is important. Uh, so let's just go back here. d6, e4, uh, in the game knight e8 was played. But quite often, e5, castles, h6. And black tries to get a closed position, you know, for his knights. Uh, that's that's really black's plan. But here we see knight e8, so without e5, white castles, b6, and now an immediate f4. And there's a dynamic aspect of this position that the c4 pawn is basically like playing a gambit. White is kind of saying to black, okay, win my c pawn. You're going to take time to get that c pawn. In the meantime, I'm going to drive up a kingside attack. I'm going to use the bishop pair. Bishop a6. Now, perhaps safest was actually f5 here to try and lock down white's intentions and keep this bishop locked in. But yeah, we see in this game, bishop a6 maybe underestimating some dangers here on the king side. Because after f5, this is actually quite dangerous. Black tries e5 here. And white just proceeds now with f6. Yeah, he's relying on the power of this pin. This is the trump card, this dark square bishop that black doesn't have. This would be an enormous pin if the knight takes. For example, knight takes bishop g5. And white can then carry on with knight g3 and maybe knight h5 later. So say like this, this is really bad for black. There's rook takes f6 here bishop h4 with the intention of knight h5 and what does black do about his shattered king side for example like this this is really bad for black so there's no real defense here so that shows some of the dangers here knight of tried to the defend with king h8 white didn't even play f takes g here even though it's very tempting white played d5 invite inviting black to hit the c pawn harder with two pieces but it's just treated like a gambit here. Knight g3 just ignoring that c pawn. It's these pieces that are really important to try and attack the black king here. This is a very important example game in the evolution of theory about the Nimza Indian defense that black needs to be very, very cautious about the double pawn complex and not simply try and grab a pawn here at the expense of king safety. So what does black do here? It's a very tricky position. If the rook moves, then f7 is exposed. For example, f takes, and if knight takes, rook takes f7. Uh, it's it's just getting very very dangerous all round. I mean, there's things like bishop h6 as well. So rook g8 is not that desirable. Knight takes f6 goes into a very nasty pin, and here white can actually build up with rook f2, for example, and then queen f1. And this pin, it's not going anywhere. 
So this is a terrible position for black. So basically, yeah, Nidorf is in a very tricky position. He played G takes F6. And now, interestingly, white focuses his attention not on F6, but actually on H7 with this next move, knight F5, simply blockading the double pawns here. And basically, the simple plan now is queen H5, rook F3, rook H3, and checkmate black on H7. Very simple and dangerous plan. Black plays bishop c8. If, for example, here knight g7, then rook f3, and the rook's just going to come here soon. So, for example, like this, rook h3. This is similar to the game actually. Here, bishop h6, and the defender of h7 is going to have to move back or lose the exchange, and then we have queen h5. Similar to the game. So, let's look at the game. Bishop c8, we have queen h5, bishop takes f5, e takes, white is free here to do rook f3 to h3. Uh, it doesn't really matter about a tempo gain, knight g7, I mean, queen can just park on h6. Uh, black tried rook g8, this is a very, very tricky position. Let's just check, just check, It's the evaluation is pretty bad here. Knight g7, yes, queen h6 might actually be the strongest move. Here, I mean, it's also dangerous, but here might actually be the strongest move to lock down that uh, that h pawn. And just if they're to stop rook f3, then rook f4. It's just extremely dangerous. It's, it's losing for black. So anyway, in the game, yeah, we see rook g8, rook f3, simple and effective. The rook's going to come to h3, but actually in this position, even in this position though, white has got something even faster if black's not careful. Can you see what white is threatening here? It's a very nice tactical idea if black was a bit casual. If white had an extra move here, if I give you five seconds, what would white actually be threatening as well as rook h3? Yeah, there's an idea of queen takes here. So, for example, knight here, just to demonstrate, like it's, you get this queen takes idea where the black king is actually being mated by force. <laughs> so, yeah, queen takes has to be parried basically on black's next move if black wants to continue the game. So, rook g7 was played. But now, yeah, it, the defender is kicked out of h7. After rook g8, rook h3, and white is threatening bishop f8, just mating on h7. So I'm, unless black, well, black's in a completely lost position here and actually resigned. Yeah, this this is a, a resignable position. But let's, let's check a few defensive tries. So this is a very short game, 21 moves. On knight g7, it seems strongest might actually be queen h4 not taking here that would be okay for black actually but actually queen h4 simply <clears throat> with the idea of moving the bishop back somewhere either f pardon me cro croaky throat <clears throat> croaky throat <laughs> so yeah just moving the bishop back soon will reveal an attack on h7 how does black actually defend uh so, for example, here then there's bishop f8, and then black's not defending h7. It just has to give up his rook and it will get mated. For example, like this. But how does black actually defend after the simple move queen h4? It keeps the battery maintained basically against h7, and black's congestion issues make the defensive task impossible so say something like this with bishop g5 threatening mate it's desperate stuff here yes it's just pretty desperate stuff it's it's all over really the bishop's going to come back here and win more material so yes um this this was quite a murderous 
game from David Bronstein. So after Rook H3, that was it. And interestingly, Mikhail Popovic had been following, tracking David Bronstein in, Bronstein in this tournament and in earlier tournaments. And he had this notebook and basically he said, um, get this game he summarized very tersely it ended up the same as Bobnik Rzevsky 1948 except that Bronstein did not play Bishop e3 but castles and f4 this is apparently the simplest since it is not so advantageous for black to reply f5 Neidorf played the nightmarish Bishop a6 and on f5 e5 and after f5 f6 he lost without a squeak this is the words of <laughs> Mikhail Bobnik. Even so, Bronstein played very accurately, although his opponent made things easy for him. So I don't know about you, but I find Bobnik's notes fascinating, and they're very, very concise, uh, you know, evaluations of games to pick up strengths and weaknesses of David Bronstein on the run-up to their world title and counter match. So he had a strong eye on on him. And yeah, this this is one of the most crushing games, actually. Seemingly very, very one-sided from the Budapest Candidates tournament. But as we know from, from some past videos on the channel, uh, Neidorf, you know, was a was a fantastic player, obviously. Uh, especially at Olympiads, he had fantastic uh, performances and the whole, you know, Sicilian Neidorf named after him, the most popular variation of the Sicilian defence. It just so happens here, we have basically critical ideas in the Nimzo Indian defense for how to defend you know the necessity of, of move orders defending with f5 for example uh, is is very very critical uh, you know from a theoretical perspective nowadays if we tour through this game and go back here to live book um, black is option actually uh, playing e5 most consistency uh, consistently so this position you know f4 for example this is a line and it's it's very different so you know things like e5 here that's very popular but if knight e8 is played with the idea of f4 then f5 there's three games in line but here and this position is perhaps pardon me perhaps okay for black there's, there's been some games here, but it looks dangerous. Probably the safest and the most trodden path is the earlier uh, E5 idea in this position. There's 26 games in live at least. But yeah, it shows how it, it can be really devastating that uh, that systems are not really worked out yet in detail or documented well. And these imbalances that come out of the opening, like the bishop pair and white's potential for sacking the C pawn, are extremely dangerous. Black needs to be aware of the real downsides, dynamic downsides of the systems that are being played here. Otherwise, you can get devastating defeats like this. So, yeah, it's 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 a a very vivid demonstration of of the bishop pair and expanding on the king side and the evolution of of Nimza engine opening theory at the time. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.